So I've done something I never do. You'll have to bear with me a bit to see how this works out. I've got a load of slides. I never really have many slides and the slides are a bit different because most of them are off of my phone and they're personal pictures that I've taken in the last few years. Um, I'm going to try and get through these, I have a hell of a lot of slides, in half an hour and then leave a good 10 minutes for us all to talk. And you're going to have to bear with me because it's kind of a story that I want to share with you and some of it is actually very personal about my, my time in open source. So everybody wants to rule the world. I assume this audience is old enough to know what I'm talking about. 1986, 1985 actually, the first concert I ever went to, first proper concert, Tears for Fears at the Glasgow Apollo. Balcony actually jumped up and down with us. Uh, it closed shortly afterwards. <laughs> so you probably didn't expect me to start with Eddie Izzard when I'm talking about uh, software. And it's a very bad picture. It was taken last Sunday morning at 11 o'clock at the Edinburgh Festival. And it was brilliant. Eddie was doing a performance of Great Expectations. And he was doing that because he's just done the audiobook of Great Expectations, which is 20 odd hours long. And his older brother, Mark, has abridged it to one hour 20. So Eddie did 55 minutes of Great Expectations from this abridged version reading, and then 25 minutes where he just performed. And it was absolutely amazing. And it, it was an incredible performance, but it was also really touching because Eddie was fixated by numbers. So he was born 150 years to the day that Dickens was born. And we were sitting in a room called the Music Room in the assembly halls in Glasgow on George, uh, Edinburgh rather, Edinburgh Festival, on George Street. Um, 150 years to the day earlier was the last time that Dickens had read in that room from one of his books. So clearly Eddie had sort of blackmailed the festival people to put this on at the last minute. We got tickets a couple of days before, which is how it happened. And some of what I'm going to talk about is about anniversaries and numbers, which is why this really brought things to mind. He also read a line that Pip said, and I've, I also never speak with notes, but I've got a couple of quotes which I don't do either, and I'll get them wrong. So Pip says, tomorrow was staring me in the face with a stronger gaze than I. And I kind of think that's where we are as a society now. And it really stuck with me. It really resonated. It tied into the things I've been thinking about for the last few weeks and months with Trustable and other projects I'm working on. And there was one other thing. So this community really sucks. We suck at including people from all sorts of diverse backgrounds. And it would be really nice if things change. Nobody's got a magic wand, but I'm sure we're at a point where we're moving into a future where it will. But it was lovely being in that room and seeing a man get on stage dressed as he was without the very conservative audience in Edinburgh that he was presenting to batting an eyelid. So it really meant a lot in a lot of different ways. Now, who else was in this room in January and who can spot my obvious mistake? Yeah, I would imagine a few of you were. Despite having been told people wouldn't be sort of really up and open source, looking around this room, I'm guessing you will be. So the deliberate mistake is the spelling of John. There shouldn't be an H in it. Uh, this is the closing keynote at FOSDEM. Everybody know what FOSDEM is? So that's how I started my year, and I start almost every year at FOSDEM with 8,000 software developers. You can usually spot me because I stick out like a sore thumb. Um, this room was absolutely rammed full of people. There was standing room only. What you can't see is behind where I took this photograph from. There were lines of people. And it, it was kind of amazing because Mad Dog was uh, doing the closing keynote and in particular, he was talking about anniversaries. So he started with a photograph of his godson who's Brazilian. There was no particular reason that he did it, but he did it to share the love. So I'm gonna introduce you today to Ronan who's really pleased to be in my deck. Ronan is my nephew, he's seven. He lives in Scotland in a place called Perth and he does a much better deck than I do. Who knew kids do PowerPoint at seven in school? So uh, Ronan's gonna actually feature as we go through my deck a little bit. Um, but what John was talking about, what Mad Dog was talking about was anniversaries, and in particular, the number 50. Because this year, it's 50 years since he became a Unix developer. And he was talking about a lot of other anniversaries, including the fact that uh, Linux 
version 1.0 was 25, the OSI and OSI definition were 21. Um, and this gentleman, this is probably the worst photograph I have of myself, so you're really honoured that I'm sharing it with you. Uh, this gentleman on the left, I'm guessing everybody in the room knows, Linus Torvalis. Linus is 50 in December, as is not in December, but this year, um, Jim Zemlin, who runs the Linux Foundation, and as am I. Unfortunately, or perhaps um, unsurprisingly, I didn't make Mad Dog's lists of things that are important in open source in 50 this year. Really sadly, no woman did. So if we go back 50 years, what was happening in 69? So in March, we had the, the bed-in, the love-in in Amsterdam, John and Yoko. That led on through June to one of the things that um, Mad Dog referenced, the Stonewall uh, riots. Then the summer of love in Woodstock, and of course, the moon landing. Now, if anybody hasn't seen this exhibition in London at the, the Science Museum, it's absolutely fantastic. Of course, that's Apollo 10, not 11, but they do, they have a whole uh, bunch of stuff around Apollo 11 that's brilliant too. So 50 years ago, all of this was going on, but other stuff was going on. And this is my uh, co-director, Open UK, and uh, friend Stuart's, uh, Stuart McIntosh's screen that I, I took a picture of. Does anybody know what that is? So it's from 1969, as I'm sure you can spot all over the place, and it actually starts in April. I focused on August because it's when my birthday is. And it's a discussion on RFC, which effectively started the, the internet um, everything that's discussed in this chat later went on to become what we know today as the internet. So effectively, it's 50 years old as well. Of course, pre-69, a lot had gone on to get us to that stage. And in the 60s, we had these massive computers. Now, I'm sure somebody in this room is going to tell me what this is because I'm not good on this front. But the, the way Mad Dog described these massive mainframe computers back in Brussels was that computers were physically huge and logically small, memory measured in kilobytes, disk measured in megabytes, and programs that ran one at a time. Not something that would work very well in our world today. We move on to the 70s, things start to get smaller. The 80s, we're starting to see home computers, the ZX Spectrums are put away. Uh, for those of you who are around, you might recognize that. Okay, I took it in 2015, not 1985. But uh, we started to really look forward in the 80s to what the future was going to bring and to look at lots of technological advancements that maybe we're living with today. In my case, I got obsessed with Pac-Man and I was told by the, the male teacher at school who taught me to code that I should avoid computers for the rest of my life. Um, by the 90s, I was learning to word process in one of these, and then the noughties. And the noughties for me was really when things started to change. So as uh, Laura said, I've been a lawyer for 25 years, and my legal career really started in the late 90s when I moved in-house with a company called Dixon's, who you probably all know on the high street. And I moved into Dixon's to work on FreeServe. I was part of a team of 12 that was a management team that set up FreeServe. You've probably worked out I like free stuff, and the thing with FreeServe was you stopped having to pay a monthly subscription to go online. It was pretty groundbreaking at its time, and it was IPO'd. It was the first and biggest IPO in the dot-com bubble in Europe for between 1.3 and 1.5 billion, and uh, sold later for 1.6 billion. And for me, what was important about that was I saw a lot of stuff. I was very privileged as a, you know, sort of not really a fully signed up geek, but somebody working on the periphery, I got to see a lot of stuff that I thought you could never imagine. And I went to Paris on a business trip. We went to the Marais and they showed us a fridge. And in 2000, this fridge could connect and stock manage your content of your fridge, connect to the supermarkets, order from the supermarket. It could provide you recipes for the food. It could make sure that it was all fully nutritious and balanced for you and it could deal with your payments. Except the problem was that you could put it in people's houses and the internet existed, but it was crap. It just didn't do anything fast enough. So what really has changed for me around the internet is the fact that we have true connectivity now. And that's a critical factor in where we've got to with technology and where we're going. Uh, this is my phone. 
somebody in the room can probably cor correct me. I think it's from 2003. I know it was before I left Dixon's. The first phone I ever had was in 1996, no, 94. I was a trainee solicitor in London and they asked if anyone would like to go to Cornwall on a Friday. So I put my hand up. They were going to send me to Cornwall and pay for it. And what I was going to do was to attach something called an Anton Pillar order to a Spanish trawler. And you had to go and hammer it on. Um, so I went because I got a weekend in Cornwall. Uh, by the time I got to Cornwall, somebody met me because apparently it was terribly dangerous. And I was met by a couple of policemen to do it with me. But I had a mobile phone. It was about this big. And it was the only time anybody had ever let me use one. Almost 10 years later, I had one of these. I sometimes switch this on because I've still got the charger just to look up a number because they're all still on there. Um, this obviously is not from 2008 if you look at what the apps are, but it's a front screen of my iPhone. Um, I probably get hung for admitting I've got one. Um, I live by the app. If anything happens to my phone, my life just is destroyed. I cannot cope without the ability to do my banking, probably give me too much data, and I play Pokemon. Um, everything that I do is on this phone. Now, when that was invented in 2008, I worked at Canonical, and Jane, Jane Silber, our CEO, went out to buy one, and we were fascinated. None of us had seen anything like it, and that was without apps. There was nothing to do on it. It wasn't really much more than a phone with internet. Now, can anybody name these three? I don't know what to call them, so you can identify the people and the dummies separately. Um, these three icons, mascots, can anybody identify those? Jelly bean, ice cream sandwich, honeycomb. So this is not 2008, the photo, but the first release of Android was. This is at Mountain View and the, the sort of campus at Google. Um, and of course, in 2008, I joined Canonical, and I, this is something I've talked many times about, but when I joined, I thought I knew what open source meant, and I could write you a lawyer's definition of it, and I could put warranties and things in contracts about it, but I had no clue. And I had no clue for a very long time, and I'm still in a constant learning curve about it. Um, I think Canonical is a, a seminal company, because when we look now at cloud, I'm told, and I'd need to go and check somehow the stats, that the highest instances of um, an OS on any cloud provider across all cloud providers is still Ubuntu. And some of the technology in Ubuntu at that time and still today is really groundbreaking. The involvement I had with Canonical took me into OpenStack in 2012. I was part of what was called the drafting committee, the legal committee that set OpenStack up. And we looked at things like IP and antitrust and competition policies to allow all these big companies to come together and work together. And I, I think that's an interesting story, maybe. But what's more interesting is that one of the things that's really, really changed is cloud. So if you add up these phones, the internet, and cloud, what you get is the ability for a seven-year-old child to walk into a shop in the center of London, pick up a device he's never seen before that isn't his, go on and start to tap and someone open a program for him and be able to code in the middle of a retail environment. That is just unimaginable. But that's today, that's what we're living in. Um, I'm not going to go through this in any detail because I've got slightly less time to talk than I was going to, and I actually think that this room knows what software is. I also think you know what those are and how you get from one to the other and who this guy is. So for me, software isn't just about the code and the licenses, and for lawyers for a long, long time, what we focused on is things like the OSI definition, the four freedoms, and what that means in terms of licenses being approved as open source or not. I think it's about much, much more. And I think today, what it's about is collaboration that's gone from hobbyist people doing stuff in their bedrooms, which were potentially world changing, to organizations showing huge respect for that and committing massive amounts of funding to ensure that those brilliant developers get to do that brilliant development all over the world. Um, and we've taught the world how to collaborate. So 
I and all the other people I know who've been doing this kind of stuff around open source for a long time are being asked constantly by many, many sectors if we can tell them and explain to them and show them and give them documents and help them to develop collaboration because they just don't know how to do it and it's not easy for big companies to do it. And I think that collaboration is absolutely critical to the future and where we're going. So I might not go into the detail on the, the coding side, but I will go into a little bit of detail on software patents because I can't resist. Um, this is a very old slide. I've used this for about a decade. And software patents are a difficult topic. A patent is something that protects innovation and is designed to reward innovation. It's a monopoly. When you've got it, it's not like any other IP right, intellectual property right. It's a way of stopping anybody else using the same idea. Now, I will happily say that my personal view is that software patents shouldn't exist. I personally did not study patents as a lawyer in any of the universities I ever studied in because I thought they were irrelevant to anything to do with what we do. However, they exist and OIN, the organization I'm going to talk about, is absolutely agnostic, so I'm not representing their views. Um, that monopoly right was given as a reward and to encourage innovation. And what's happened is that it's gone a very different path. And today, what we've seen is these large companies that have spent decades using the ability to register software patents to build up armories. I first came across, I've told you I'm not a patent lawyer, I first came across uh, patents not through a troll, but through a major organization who built up one of those armories around 2000. And they approached a company that I was involved with, and they had this big, long screed of paper. And it was that old-fashioned computer paper that used to perforate and tear, not like you'd see today. And they just gave me this reams and reams of paper with lists and lists of the patents we were infringing. And then they gave me a letter that told us to cease and desist or pay this much. Now that was a, a, a practicing entity. That was a company that actually did stuff in the technology sector and which was charging other organizations a license fee for using those patents. A troll's a different thing. A troll's a non-practicing entity, so a company that only owns the patents so that it can enforce it. Um, this looks more like the troll my dad had in his car in the 60s, which I'm just rather attached to. Again, another old slide that anybody who's heard me speak about patents in the last 10 years or eight years has probably seen. Um, I think this is from 2011 or 2012. So it's not surprising when you've got companies that have built up these armories, seeing disruption come towards them, that their response is to use the tools and the weapons that they've got. And what they've used is patents because they're sitting there as something that's a really hard stop. A patent litigation on average in the US costs $200 million. Not many people can afford to do that and not many people have the insurance to cover that risk. If you were a lawyer like me and you'd been looking at warranties and indemnities around IP for the last decade, you would see increasingly that uh, people just won't take on liability for patents if they can avoid it because it is such a high risk. Um, I work for, no shame about this, I, I work for the Open Invention Network and I have since I left Canonical in 2013. Prior to that, I took Canonical in to the Open Invention Network as a paying uh, funder, a board member, an associate board member. And we put several million into OIN as opposed to registering our own patents. And the, the registration process is slow and it's expensive. So we decided to support the community instead. I believe very strongly in this, so I stayed involved afterwards. And what OIN does very, very simply is at zero cost, and whether you hold patents or not, anybody, any company can sign up. It's all online. We have no control over who signs and who doesn't. Everybody signs the same license. It's non-negotiable. No matter what, you know, how big or small a company you are, you sign the same thing or you don't sign. And it creates a cross-license where each company says to the rest of that group, I won't sue you. I won't sue you in relation to any patents that I have that you might infringe 
to the extent that they're used in open source and read on this definition. The definition is a list that started as Linux. It's now over 2,000 packages. So 48 hours ago, and um, please all Google this later, Microsoft made a commitment around this. Um, last October, Microsoft signed up to OIN. So if you go online, it takes about 10 minutes and you sign up, you will have access to the Microsoft patents that read on the open source definition at zero cost. The XFAT patents, which a lot of the Microsoft litigation has been around, were not covered by that definition. And the announcement 48 hours ago is that it will be added this year that anybody who signs up will now also have a free license to the XFAT patents. If you go and read about it, you'll see that they're some of the most controversial patents for open source and uh, a lot of the litigation's been around them. There are companies like Panasonic listed in articles as having to spend huge amounts of money three, five years ago to take those licenses. So OIN does a lot of great work and I'd encourage everybody to sign up to it. If you haven't, um, please feel free to ask me any questions about it. But part of what for me, is really important there, is it's collaboration. It's open source meeting the world by collaborating. So going back to where we've got to today, 2019, this is actually another great exhibition. This is in Dundee at the V&A, and it's the gaming exhibition, which is really fab. Um, my life, at least, and I think everybody else's, is a screen. We're looking at blockchain, wondering if it's going to be the next web, wishing we'd bought cryptocurrency earlier before it went up in price. And most of us live by the app. The app has become something useful that we need every day. We need to have a device. Um, at the same time, we're at risk, and we're at risk of our data and what we get to see online being controlled by the big tech companies. We live in a world where, I think this is age eight plus, kids are given boxes that teach them how to code and it's nothing strange, it's nothing abnormal. So back to Ronan in the Apple store on Regent Street. Um, I discovered how competitive my nephew is when he had just coded this little sphere, which is a little robot to go around an obstacle course and a boy put his foot in the way and you can imagine the get out of the way response, which she was told not to do and to be polite. So the next time he shouted, get out of the way, please. He did quite well. I was proud of him. So that is, as it says, a future. And it's a future that's now. I'm hoping that it's beginning to come together, that all of these things have created a world that we live in today. And they all have software underlying them. The future, who knows what it's going to be? Um, we're going to find that we have robots, we have AI, we're going to have medicine and bionic people rebuilt using electronics. We're not going to need to go to shops because a bot will deliver or a drone will drop something to us within an hour or two. The vehicles will be driverless, whether they're private or they're public. This is great. So one of the jobs that's not listed for me on this is that I'm the chair of an advisory group for the United Nations for their um, innovation labs. And this is a, a little bus in Helsinki that uh, they're about to actually release on the streets, but which is out in this campus, uh, very environmentally friendly and a much better way to be transported than anything we've been doing till now. And of course, we'll do more and more research using these things. Perhaps in the future, uh, the women in the room won't be such a minority and there won't be a need to even mention it. So who knows where this future is going to go? Very appropriate with all you space guys in the room. I didn't know you were going to be here. Um, I believe that there is no doubt today that it's going to be open source. So software is eating the world and open source is eating its lunch, as they, they say in the US. Um, the reality is that the adoption of open source in the last year has just gone through the roof. I think it's something, I'm not good with numbers, but I think it's something like 76% of companies now admit to using open source, and over 50% are saying that they're going to set up some sort of governance and open source office. Um, I did this deck before the Microsoft announcement. But this is my, my mate Steve Wally keynoting last year at um, Linux Foundation and quoting his CEO asking to be judged by their actions of today. Now, when a company like Microsoft is doing that, open source is here.
So, briefly, because this is where I get technical again, Trustable is um, a project looking at software. And what it's looking at is everything I've just talked to you about, where all of this stuff is coming together to create a new world that we're all going to live in. The space odyssey is here. So all of these devices that are sitting in your homes, um, I will admit that I have Alexa. We don't get on very well, but I have her. She doesn't like Scottish people. She doesn't understand when I instruct her to do things. So I fight with her a lot. But I have these kind of devices scattered around my house. I'm sure many of you do too. This is our future, and it is just going to go further and further. Who knows whether children like Ronan are going to have jobs? whether there's going to be enough work left for them to do with an autonomous future. And the more software that's out there, the more we have to trust it, and the more we don't know where it's going. So I always liken this to a construction dispute of old. You get a bunch of builders working on your house or your office or whatever it is, and something goes wrong. What you will find is it's nobody's fault. Whether the roof has caved in and killed somebody, or the building just isn't watertight. Everybody points the finger at somebody else, and that's where we're going to end up in software. The problem is, the risks are the same, and the risks are growing day by day. So what we have is a world where software potentially will cause death, it will cause personal injury, it will cause damage to property, loss of income, loss of earnings, the list goes on. But the classic legal liabilities that all of us would look at for anything practical today will move to the software space. Now I've had the fortune or misfortune to spend 25 years reviewing contracts around that kind of stuff and as the adoption increases so does the liability except these days you're looking at lots of small companies with no resources behind them being asked to sign up to contracts with liabilities 5, 10 million even if it's a couple of million, they don't have it. And you can't really easily buy insurance around that. So this project was set up three years ago by CodeThink. I know there's at least one person in the room from CodeThink. I don't know if there are others, but I would welcome you very much to talk more about this when we get to questions in a few minutes. Um, this project was set up three years ago as an engineering project, focusing on what makes software engineering good. So one of the problems around liability is if you try to capture software a moment in time, it is a moment in time. And 10 minutes later, 10 hours later, 10 days later, you're looking at a different piece of software. So the best way to manage liability would be not to look at software, but to look at the engineering processes and to try and work out what it is that makes engineering good. What is acceptable? What's state of the art? What's good practice? And if you look in the GitLab, uh, the Trustable GitLab account, you'll see a lot of good work that's been done pulling all of that together. I got involved end of last year, beginning of this year, and brought into the project some work I'd done in the past, thinking around how you can then take that engineering and add to those good engineering practices, legal and compliance, and find a way to get everybody working around those without creating formal standards so that we have something that's measurable, self-certifiable and auditable. And the goal is to set that up in a way that we can demonstrate to insurance companies that you're doing the right thing and to make insurance more accessible. There's a complexity that is not for a Friday afternoon, which I think is my thought of genius. That's probably the only really smart thought I've ever had, which is to get a captive sitting behind all of this. And a captive is a kind of insurance company. So when you buy insurance, the insurers take your money, but they don't cover all the risk. What they'll do is they'll sell that on down a line of reinsurers, underwriters, and um, that the risk is underwritten by them. Instead of doing that, what you see in many companies, and a couple that I've worked for, is that they own their own captive insurer. So they go out and they buy insurance, and it's fronted by an insurance company, and then sitting behind it is their own money. So if they can manage the upfront risk, the risk at the back end, is manageable too. So I have this mad idea that we should ask the big tech folks to put their money into a pool captive across all of them once we've got to a stage of being able to demonstrate that the engineering is good, that our software is reasonable, so that they can help support every other company 
that's working in the software space and I let it be able to buy insurance. Um, it's complicated. It's probably a topic that you, if you're interested in, will want to talk to me offline about or come to something where we're talking about nothing but that. But at this stage on a Friday afternoon, this is what the structure looks like. And this is out of focus. So um, this is off my tea the other day. I started drinking these yogi teas that give me messages. And I, I like the messages. They're tied to the tea bag. And it says, speak to make yourself happy. Don't speak to impress others. Would anybody like to speak? <laughs> make yourself happy? No? Yes? Maybe? OK, it's late on a Friday. So I do have a couple more slides. Um, I'm happy to have more of a group discussion. Um, I'm probably really not meant to talk about this, but we all know what's going on in London at the moment, and um, I've come up from there this morning. Margaret Atwood, uh, I think from The Handmaid's Tale, I found it on Facebook, so somebody's probably manipulating my views. Um, it's worrying. But on Tuesday, it's the politician's first day back at the House of Commons, and we are having a party in the House of Commons, launching an event series for Open UK. And I have one ticket. If anybody in this room would like to go, we will take names and pull them out of a hat. You've got to get yourself to London. There will be food, there will be drinks, you will be in the building with the politicians. Some of them might stop by, who knows? In theory, we leave the building at 10 o'clock, but somebody's got to run the country. And that's it. So thank you very much for having me. If anybody wants to talk more about any of this stuff, I know it's been a bit of a ramble and wide ranging. I can pretty much promise you that that's a unique talk and not something I'll be doing again because everybody else is not on a Friday afternoon in Yorkshire thinking about beer. Thank you.